Good morning. First day of the new year, and uh, I would encourage you to fast and pray for the Buffalo Bills game tonight. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't know what's going to happen. A, a couple things. One is, when we get weather like this, sometimes people wonder, how do we know if a service is canceled? And the easiest way for you to find that out is to log in on Sunday morning to our website, which is our, which stands for Rochester, rcalvary.org. Or you can look at our social media, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, they'll in inform you as to whether we're having services. Our general rule is, is that if our parking lot is plowed, if our, our heat is on, if we have electric, if our sidewalks are shoveled, then, then we have service. But where you live in our region, your weather could be very different than what we have here. So we trust you to make the right decision for you. Uh, we do our best to make sure this is a safe place to show up. One other thing before I get started on the message, and that is uh, one of our church family is, is heading off on a missions trip. Her name is uh, Elena Howell, and uh, she's going. To, it's a medical missions trip, so in addition to sharing Jesus with people, she's also going to be uh, providing uh, inoculations and vaccines and all kinds of things, particularly for children. Would you just do me a favor right now, extend the hand towards heaven, and let's just ask God to be with her and help her to accomplish everything he has purposed for her in this trip. So Father, we're grateful that Elena is willing to go. We ask that you would guard her in this journey, that she would be at all the right places at just the right times, and that not only would she be useful in terms of medical things, but she would be useful for spiritual things as well, and that you would use her to introduce others to you. We ask that in the name of your strong son, Jesus. And everyone who agreed to that prayer said, Amen. Amen. Um, I think, by the way, didn't uh, uh, Stephen do a phenomenal job last Sunday just uh, starting us in the series of Proverbs? Yeah. I, th I think we start crossing thresholds of wisdom in our own life when we outgrow the misconceptions we have of how life is supposed to work. Because I have those misconceptions. There's ways I think should go the way I think they should go. And as long as I maintain that kind of thinking, all I ever really do is create frustration and distance. Uh, wisdom is actually the skill for living when there's no clear rule to follow. I wish there was always a commandment in Scripture that would cover every circumstance in our life, but it's not true. So the question is, when there's not a clear command, when there's not a clear rule, what am I supposed to do? And that's where wisdom is super helpful. And the book of Proverbs is a collection of wisdom. It's a collection of these things called Proverbs, these wise sayings. And many of them were written by Solomon, who is known as the wisest king to ever live. The great rulers of the world at his time actually made pilgrimages to Israel just to see him at work. One of the famous characters of all antiquity is known as the Queen of Sheba, and she came to see this incredibly wise man. And he, so he puts together, when, when he's going through life, and he, he gains wisdom in something, and he thinks of a way to say it that is, that is memorable and portable, he writes it down. By the way, that would be a really good action for any of us to take. Wouldn't it be cool if everything you figured out you could access written down somewhere? That, that would be very cool. Well, he did that. And in addition to that, if anyone else had some wisdom that they had gleaned, he wrote that down too. And he creates this anthology, this, this collection of, of wisdom. Now, if you're following through the Proverbs uh, readings and, and Bible study with us, uh, you're not quite up to uh, uh, where the Proverbs start because the first nine chapters are a series of conversations, mostly of a father to uh, his children. But but you start running into the Proverbs this week, and it'll be very, very uh, interesting. Uh, these Proverbs were actually written not for mass consumption. These Proverbs were written and related to the children of King Solomon. He wanted them to know how to live as a royal. And most of us don't think that we're royals. In fact, there is a, a New Zealand singer-songwriter who, who, who became rather famous by, by writing a song and performing it that says, we'll never be royals. 
And that's how we kind of think, but it's not how God sees us. We are his children. There's actually a place in, in 1 Peter that it tells us, you are a royal priesthood. That's how God sees us. So God gives us wisdom, not just commands, because there are some things that you can't just make a rule about, but it does make sense, right? For example, here's a proverb in Proverbs 27, 14. A loud and cheerful greeting early in the morning will be taken as a curse. You just walk into somebody's bedroom and say, God morning, and they will not think you are being nice to them, all right? God wants us to know his eternal truth, but he also wants us to know how life works. And screaming at people early in the morning is not a good option. What he also wants us to know is that his laws and his wisdom are not incompatible. That how life works and the rules that he has given us are actually in harmony. And we can learn these things. So we can learn how to love with God's commands. We can learn how to respect the prophets that he has sent. But I have seen people who have loved God's word and they love God's prophets and they still make a mess of their lives and their marriages and their workplaces and their neighborhoods. It's not a lack of love for scripture. It's a lack of wisdom. They love God's word and they want to bring other people in, but they wind up turning people off to Jesus. When people turn people off to Jesus, that's not a lack of truth, it's a lack of wisdom. So we need to learn how to live in wisdom. And Proverbs are very practical things. Uh, they're not quick fixes. It's something that you have to have kind of a, a, a regular access to so that it kind of seeps in and we, we can apply it in multiple areas of our lives. And, and it, if we have, if we try to love people without wisdom, someone's going to get hurt. Uh, if we try to, uh, to, uh, to, to explain truth without wisdom, uh, we're going to come across as being very uncaring. And uh, also, if, if, we try to, if, we, if we use technology without wisdom, um, our most viral moment could be our most stupid moment. And so God calls us to walk in wisdom. And there's two kinds of wisdom. I wish there were only one, but there are two kinds. And James, the third chapter, tells us about this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it, how? By their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about that, don't deny it. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. There's two kinds of wisdom. There's God's wisdom that operates out of humility, and then there's a world's wisdom that is driven by envy and selfish ambition, and when that is enforced, bad things happen to good people. So if we're talking about taking initiative, the question is, so what's the difference between selfish ambition and taking initiative? Like if you're asking me to, to launch out and do something, but, well, how do I know that that's not just based on my own selfish ambition? And that's a good question. Selfish ambition is, is more a drive to either get influence or to prove ourselves to other people. We're trying to get more influence. We're trying to prove who we are to other people. Whereas faith actually helps us understand we already have influence and we want to be responsible for the influence we have right where we are, wherever that is. She was 19 years old. She attended our church and she had become part of an organization on her college campus. And what she did not know is that because of uh, a series of unforeseen events, she would be asked to lead that organization in very short order. 
She did not feel prepared for it. She felt overwhelmed by it. And in addition to not feeling like she knew what she was supposed to do, there was actually a person in the administration of the college that was against that organization and actually sent her threats by email. Every single word she said or posted or wrote, everything she did, all of her decisions were scrutinized for two whole semesters. And I asked her, I said, how did you manage that? Which, by the way, not only did she survive it, she actually thrived in it. When she was done with those two semesters, her organization that she was leading was named the top student organization of over 140 organizations on campus. How many think that's a pretty good accomplishment? Yeah, that's, that's impressive. And so this is what I asked her. I said, so how did you manage to do that? And this is what she told me. She said, I read Proverbs every day. She said, the wisest person in the world took time to write down his wisdom in ways that are memorable, and it helped me figure out what should I focus on, what should I ignore, what should I prioritize, what should I leave alone, what should I give my efforts towards, and where should I just take a step back? How should I speak, and what should I not say? And at the end of those two semesters, her organization went to the top. By the way, the first time in the history of that school that that particular organization ever was voted the most significant student organization on campus. Wisdom. Proverbs 6 says this, but you lazy bones, we're already annoyed, aren't we? <laughs> but you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little extra slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. What happens? Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Proverbs 22, verse 13. The lazy person claims there's a lion out there. If I go outside, I might be killed. If all we're looking for is a little more rest, poverty will spring on us like a bandit. If we're unwilling to face any risk, in the act of attempting to protect ourselves, we will actually put ourselves at greater risk. Proverbs 26, 14 says, as a door swings back and forth on its hinges, so a lazy person turns over in bed. <laughs> I won't ask how many are, are that person, but how many might be married to that person. No, don't say that. Okay. <laughs> the thing is, very few people procrastinate in every area of their life. There are some people who are very proactive and initiate in some areas of our life and, and, and not so much in others. Uh, we tend not to ask for help in some areas because we're afraid that we will appear foolish, we'll be embarrassed, or, or sometimes we don't give attention to something because it's boring. It's boring. How many have ever been bored? How many are bored right now? <laughs> hmm. Consequently, we don't take action. A student might never miss a team practice and they might never miss a party, but when it comes time to studying for exams, just not hard, it's not uh, enjoyable. Or a parent might be motivated to climb the corporate ladder and be very good at a hobby or a sports endeavor so much that they're actually awarded for it, but spending time with family is not nearly as exciting. A young adult can have a great social life but no interior life. They have fun with their friends, but they don't like the person they're becoming. A person can have the latest, fastest, newest, best technology, and at the same time, they've maxed out their credit card and they're drowning in debt. As it turns out, buying is more enjoyable than budgeting. So there's often an area we procrastinate in. What's, what the Proverbs tell us is don't wait. Don't wait for external motivation. Don't wait for someone else to come along and motivate you to take care of something. 
Proverbs 6, 6 says this, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. How many, see, he keeps using the word lazy bones. Yeah. Uh, Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. So I'm going to recommend three areas that you might want to take initiative in and three areas that even if we're excelling in other things, we might struggle in these things. And this might be a really good thing to start at the beginning of this year. And the first area to take initiative in is friendship. Friendship. Friendship is not a luxury. Why? Because no one left to themselves ever becomes wise. When we are left alone to ourselves, we don't become wiser. Um, what makes a friend? Well, a friend is there for you, right? They're, they're a friend for you. And it's so easy to focus on who is there for us rather than focusing on who am I there for? You see, we all want wisdom on how to find a friend, but Proverbs gives us wisdom on how to be a friend. And some of us have been so frustrated in life because when it comes to choosing friends, we have chosen poorly. But Proverbs tells us if you want to have friends, be a friend. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. That means that they're going to challenge you a little bit. And our culture can define friendship as simply being someone who agrees with you all the time. This is how we say it. They accept me as I am. Well, that's a nice feeling, but are you going to grow in that environment if they can't challenge you? In fact, if someone challenges you in some area of life and recommends that there could be something that you would do that would make you sharper in life, will that offend you? Will you cut off that relationship because they didn't accept you as you were? Proverbs 27, 6 says, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. We should, we should have people around us who, who can call us up, who can encourage us, who can speak into our lives. They can tell us when, when, we're, when we're coming over an edge. If, if your friends only agree with you all the time, you need to give them permission to speak into your life. You will not become wiser by getting people to agree with you. We don't get better that way. So we have to keep our friendships in good repair, in good repair and that takes effort. And this is, this is one of the great mistakes people make. Well, if it, if it takes work to keep a friendship, then then they must not be a really good friend. People do this with marriage, too. If, if it's work to be married, then, then marriage must not be good. Marriage is work. And the best marriages are when both people do the work. It helps if they do it without complaining. <laughs> Just do the work. You can make money without friends, but you cannot become wise without friends. So friends, secondly, work. Uh, Proverbs 12, 24 says, work hard, become a leader. Be lazy, become a slave. Proverbs 14, 23 says, work brings profit, but mere talk, mere talk leads to poverty. The question is, do we bring our best to our work or do we get by with the bare minimum? And I understand that if you, in some work environments, if you go in and you do your best, you might actually create some friction because there are these little pockets of darkness in our world where apathy is the reigning influence and anybody that steps out is looked down on as the, well, they've got a whole bunch of names, most of which I can't repeat from this particular place. See me in the lobby and I'll tell you what they are. <laughs> when you do less than your best, 
No one benefits, including you. No one. Learning how to get by with less is not a form of wisdom. Oh yeah, I know how to, I know how to bring the least amount of energy to that and still get paid. That's not wisdom, that's cheating. This is not about perfectionism. Perfectionism will paralyze you, but doing the best you can where you are with what you have honors God and opens doors. Prayer itself is a way to take initiative, right? You can pray about the place you're working at. I know lots of people who complain about the place they work at. Why not convert it to a prayer? That's a way to take initiative. Uh, third area is money. I know it's the worship team to come up now. Uh, no matter how much you make or how much you don't make, you need a plan for your resources. And the challenge is developing a plan often feels overwhelming. And if you're developing that plan with someone else, your spouse, makes it even more complicated. What I can tell you is I've been in ministry a long time and what I've discovered is all the money gets spent. Um, I was, most premarital counseling I do, couples are young and they're beginning their journey and they're not at their income earning potential and so things are tight those first few years. You know. And uh, so I had this one couple I was doing premarital counseling and, and they, they did a budget for the first year and they had boatloads of money left over. Like that's the most money I've ever seen a married couple having left over. And I, I said, well, that's cool. What's your plan for that? What matters to you in your life? Because what I can tell you is all that money is going to be spent. Is it going to be spent on what matters to you? Because you get to make that choice. And here's the thing about it. Like there are people in this room right now you have an impulse for generosity. You hear about things and you want to respond, but because you've had no plan for your resources, there's nothing you can do in that moment. And in addition to feeling bad, you actually feel guilty. What if when we were putting a budget together, we would set aside an amount of money that we could be generous with? That takes a plan. The wise don't wait for a financial crisis to start developing a plan. So we can take initiative with our friends, we can take initiative with our work, we can take initiative with our money. But what I want you to know is that God is the one who took initiative with us. He looked on a world that was filled with brokenness and pain. He saw people that were misusing the options they had in creating absolutely horrible situations for others. He saw unfairness, he saw injustice, he saw brutality, he saw unrestrained lust, he saw corrupted power, he sees all of it. So what did he do? Did he wait for things to get better? No. He took the initiative. He sent his son, his one and only son, to pay the price so that our lives could be different. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, thank you for taking the initiative with us. Help us to take initiative and the options and opportunities you have provided in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.